Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets SEL podcast. This is Andrea Samadhi. This interview will be broadcast on YouTube as well as on the regular podcast channel. So be sure to look for the YouTube link in the show notes if you'd like to view the video. Today we're speaking with Jennifer Miller. She's an author and illustrator of the blog, Confident Parents, Confident Kids, with over 22,000 followers. She has her master's degree in instructional leadership with a focus on social and emotional development and has a new book coming out just shortly after the SEL exchange this October called Confident Parents, Confident Kids, Raising Emotional Intelligence in Ourselves and Our Kids from Toddlers to Teenagers. Welcome, Jennifer. It's great to meet you. Thank you. Great to meet you. And I'm excited about our conversation today. Me as well. I'm, I'm excited to also see you as a speaker at Castle's SEL Exchange this October. And I know that this is an opportunity to showcase your research with educators nationally and internationally. It's so exciting. I'm so looking forward to it. It's wonderful that the exchange is bringing all these folks together who are passionate about the same thing, helping children uh, develop their their hearts and their spirits, as well as their minds. Absolutely. Well, can, first question for you is, can you give us a sneak peek of the insights that you'll be sharing at the Pre-Conference Institute this fall? You know, I think that as parents, we feel like uh, educators operate in their own world. Teachers are busy people. And uh, so we, we often kind of don't want to disturb or, or hang back and kind of wait uh, to be approached. And I think uh, on the educator side, parents tend to live in another world where they're busy and they're focused on their careers and their family life. And so sometimes there's that disconnect between the worlds. And um, so we're going to share some research that we did recently that shows that that our hopes and dreams for our kids are not that far apart. And often it's the language that we use around children's development that is different. And so if even just by tweaking our language a bit oh. and sharing a common language, we can really talk about children's social and emotional development in ways that are connecting. And I, I really think that social and emotional learning can become the glue or the connective tissue that brings families and schools together if we just make some, some changes in our, our listening to one another and, and the language that we use so that we're really able to connect on those issues. It's so true because when we first got exposed in our household to growth mindset, we were shocked because we've always told our kids, oh, you're so smart to motivate them. And then it was hard to change that language into, and, and we both work around kids in schools. And then I had to change it to, well, you work so hard. And it was a little bit of tweaking and effort to get a different result, but we had no idea the research behind was showing that, you know, you're not supposed to tell your kids how smart they are. Yes. But that, I love hearing that because that was really, you were into a habit of saying, oh, you're so smart. And, and so in order to really inform your parenting through, through your new knowledge of the research, you worked on it. You became intentional about it. I often tell parents, st stick a, a, a sticky on your refrigerator just as a reminder uh, because our language with our children really does matter. And uh, so I love how you turned around a, a small little language change in your family life to really help your children see that they're always learning, they're always changing, they're, there's always an opportunity to grow. Right, and just as we can do this, it can go into the curriculum, little changes in the way that the curriculum, you know, on a math problem, well, if you haven't got it yet, keep going. So, right. you know, it's, it's wonderful. Right. Well, I know that we've both heard this question many times and it's often kicked around in different settings. And I hope this interview can shed some light on some of the solutions to bridge the gap in this next question. 
And the question is, whose job is it to educate our kids? And of course, we know the role of our schools to educate students, but teachers can't be the only solution. The, with the fact that students are with their teachers around six hours a day, about 100 days a year, we can't rely on only the school because there's a lot of time they're not in school. Bringing us to you, Jennifer, for your expertise, whose job is it to educate our kids? It is absolutely shared. We have a shared responsibility, and that's why I love that we're going to be talking about how that works out uh, to share that responsibility. But if you think about it, parents are children's first and primary social and emotional teachers. But also teachers who do not take a focus on social and emotional learning are teaching emotions in the classroom. Often it's called the hidden curriculum because children learn about their social interactions, they learn about their feelings through modeling. And so they're watching teachers uh, either collaborate with one another or they're watching teachers conflict with one another or shut the door and shut out the rest of the, the school when they're trying a new practice. Or they learn that they need to squash their feelings when it's test taking time. There's, you can't show anxiety, you can't show stress even if you deeply feel it. The only time feelings can be shown is on the playground. That's the children are learning that. So, um, so there is very much a shared responsibility between parents and educators when it comes to children's social and emotional development. And so how powerful is it if we're actually talking about it and becoming intentional about coordinating how we're advancing their social and emotional learning? Absolutely. So what do you think parents should be doing more of at home? Like I, I gave you an example of how we've changed our homework time and our language but can you give a little bit more, some more strategies or ideas of what it would look like for SEL to be integrated into family life, maybe from a young child right through to how do we do this with teens? Yeah, um, one really simple way is by recognizing and articulating feelings in family life. And that seems very basic. But consider the fact that adults struggle to name their feelings, particularly when there's a mashup of feelings. We're feeling hurt and guilty and shameful um, and regretful. We, we might have a whole stack up of emotions and it becomes difficult for us to express it. So uh, if we think about children in the early childhood years, are expanding their vocabulary in general, their, their language development, it takes even longer for children to develop a feelings vocabulary. Why? Because feelings are complex, because culturally we feel like feelings are a weakness, so we tend to not articulate them as much or as well as our thoughts. Uh, and, and we just are not in the habit as adults of, of well articulating our emotions. So one thing that parents can do is, is ask, you look like you're worried, is that right? So not assuming that we know exactly how our child is feeling, but we can see the symptoms, we can identify the physical symptoms, we can see their facial expression, is, is worried, they've got a furrowed brow. Uh, so we can ask them, we can name it. I, it sure looks like you're worried. Is that right? And then just that simple act, that simple question begins to promote that feelings vocabulary. And what happens is that children raise their self-awareness. They begin to understand that the physical feelings and sensations they're experiencing 
are important messages, internal messages that they're receiving. And now they've got a word for it. And now when they go to school, they can communicate that to their teacher if they need to. I'm really feeling panicky. Can you help me? Uh, so they can assert their needs then. And, and that helps build their self-management skills. So that small act of becoming intentional about articulating feelings and recognizing them in our children and in ourselves, by the way, how can, how can you as a parent say, I, I'm getting heated. I can feel my temperature rising. I can feel my heart beating quickly. I know I'm getting really frustrated here. I need to take a moment. What a powerful modeling moment for our children to see that, oh, my parents understands that they're, or recognizes that they're feeling upset and they're taking care of themselves in that moment. So every day in our daily routines, we have those opportunities to articulate emotions, to recognize them, and then to talk about what we're going to do about them. This is incredible, Jennifer, because my youngest will sometimes look at me when I'm thinking or focusing, and she'll say, Mom, you look concerned, and she's freaking out that I look concerned, and it's not my concerned look, but she doesn't have the vocabulary yet. So now when she does that again, I now know to go back to her and say, no, I'm not concerned. This is my, my concentrating face. Or, oh, you're focusing. Yeah, this is my focus face. Or it, sometimes even when I'm driving and you know you have to stay focused on what you're doing. And sometimes they're talking back and forth in the back and they're like, mom, you look concerned. No, I'm not concerned. I'm focusing. So yeah, well, know the your children take cues from you. Wow. And they're always looking for those cues. So if you're worried, then they have reason to be worried. Huh. So if you want to check that out, like, is mom worried? Because I, you know, I want to know <laughs> if this is a time for me to be worried. So I love that because they're also starting to develop their empathy skills where they're trying to interpret other people's thoughts and feelings. And so they're getting really valuable practice with you. Actually, no, I'm just, I'm just really focused right now. I'm trying to concentrate on the road. So I love that dialogue that you have with your children. It seems so simple, but look at all the skills that it's promoting. I had no idea that that's what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Identifying emotions, because we don't do that enough in our, in our household, for sure. But how can schools now effectively partner with our, our families in support of our children? You know, um, understanding how to support children's social and emotional development is a learning process for us all. Consider the fact that we are learning social and emotional skills, skills like collaboration, like empathy, like uh, being aware of your feelings, self-awareness, like self-control. We work on those for a lifetime. As adults, we're working still on honing those skills. So understanding how to support children's development of those skills is a learning process for all of us. And certainly educators who have taken a focus on social and emotional learning have a, a, an advantage that maybe they've had years of expertise in doing this, but we are all learning together. So, you know, what, what I wonder is how can parents and teachers begin a regular conversation about the children that they love and how they are playing a role in their social and emotional development. Parents are absolutely experts in their children's temperaments. What temperaments or emotional reflexes were they born with? Do they tend to shy away from new people or new challenges or do they dive right in? Uh, so they, they bring a lot of expertise. Well, maybe they're challenged with developing friendships. How can teachers ask those questions uh, starting with strengths? Where do you see 
that your child is really excelling and how can we build on their ability to collaborate, on their sensitivity to others' feelings? How can we build on their sense of responsibility and, and ability to make good choices? So I think if there's this back and forth dialogue about social and emotional learning between parents and teachers, we can learn a whole lot from one another. Definitely, definitely. Well, thinking about all of this, what would be your top five tips for parents to improve and be able to support their local educator in a better way? Yeah, good question. So, you know, first I would say, uh, don't wait, initiate a relationship. So often we kind of let the teacher lead because they are the professional. But, but what I would say is, is go immediately before school or when school starts, shake a hand, make eye contact, uh, give your name, give your child's name, just do a, a, an introduction and begin the get to know yous. Uh, because it, it takes a while to create a caring connection with a teacher. And, and also, you're going to have these few little spurts of time. Uh, like my parent-teacher conferences are 10 minutes long. That's nothing. It's so fast. It so how do you create this caring relationship? Well, it's, it's showing up. It's, it's uh, asking how they're doing at pickup time. It's sticking your head in. Do you need anything at drop off time? So, so take the initiative one to start the relationship. It doesn't have to be big, just small and warm and caring is, is all you need. Uh, and then show up when you're invited. Uh, uh, do what you can to be there for every event or every time that a teacher opens up the classroom to you or has an art show or a math night or a coffee for parents. Do what you can to show up because that's another opportunity to create that caring connection. And then, so that's one to initiate, show up, ask about social and emotional issues. What do you do? Tell me a bit about what you do to create a caring classroom community. What do you do school-wide to create a caring community school-wide? How do you help students learn collaboration skills or teamwork? How do you help them learn about responsible decision-making? Just Getting that conversation started, asking those questions, and then saying, is there anything that I can do to get involved? Even if you're a busy person, there may be simple ways that you can get involved. So why not ask the question? And Andrea, after this, I will give you a tool that has conversation starters. So parents don't have to start from scratch. They can, they can grab it and say, oh, here's some ideas for questions I can, can ask. Um, and then look for, for periodic touch points throughout the year. Uh, in addition to parent-teacher conferences, how can you touch base with your teacher? Maybe it's through email. How do they like to be communicated with best? If it's a short email, then just touch base and talk about simple things. I really appreciate the lesson that you did last week, it resonated with our family. We talked about it. It was exciting and interesting. What if you did that? Oh, yeah. How often do teachers hear from parents that there's a ripple effect home, that, that you know, you're talking about the lessons at home and you're talking about the learning? Yeah, so or that's photograph, too. Of oh, yeah. I love that. That goes like, I remember my daughter was learning electricity and so she asked for some sort of circuit thing for Christmas and it, it all started from the classroom and so I took a picture and the, the teacher wrote back on Christmas morning. I thought I'll just throw this out, but it was, I, I've never heard of this before for someone to be connected to their school email and wrote back and said, thank you so much. It made my day. <laughs> I thought that I'll just shows you how meaningful it was to her. Right. Right, it, it makes a difference. And, and as we were talking, there was one thing that just stuck in my mind because 
I've been in the classroom and I know what it's like. And there's such a difference when you're talking to a teacher from from the, the empathetic point of view that you know what it's like in the classroom. Even volunteering and sitting in the back of a classroom marking or doing something if you're invited to do that, it's eye-opening because I forgot how fast-paced the classes are. Like they're doing a spelling test and suddenly they're off to switch to another lesson and the oh, yeah. teacher didn't even get a, a chance for a sip of water, let alone a bathroom break. Right. And so there's that perception like, oh, it's an easy job, summer's off. But when you've done it or when you're sitting there watching it, that's a totally different picture. So I, I always think it's great if you can sit in a class and see what happens. I agree. It really builds empathy for the incredible skills and energy and passion that teachers bring into the classroom. Um, so if, if your teacher invites you in, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to go and experience what actually happens. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. What about some tips for teachers to better connect with parents? Well, for teachers, um, I think, uh, first of all, just looking for those opportunities to build a caring connection from the beginning and often. So how can you find little ways, uh, again, at drop-off time, at pick-up time, to make a connection one-on-one, -on -one, get to know the parents' families, um, I also have a tool called Get to Know You where uh, parents or, te I'm sorry, teachers can send to home to families a, a simple worksheet at the beginning of the year that asks some personal questions oh. to get to know family life. What's family life like? So that they quickly get to understand this, their students and, and the families that they go home to. Oh. So how can you create that caring relationship in small, frequent ways. Right. And then also, how can you look at parents as experts in their own right about their children? So they bring a whole lot of expertise about how their children learn, uh, where their children are, are really strong, and where their children struggle. So those conversations can be invaluable intel for teaching and learning in the classroom. So how can teachers look at parents as tremendous resources and, and a wealth of knowledge about the children that they see every day? Definitely. Well, that's, those are some great tips on both sides. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the release of your book coming out this, are you thinking October or November? Do you know? November 5th is the, the big day. Excellent. And I know you can pre-order now, so I'll put all the links in there for people to pre-order. But great. can you give us some background of why you wrote the book and the support, support that you see it will provide for families and parents? Sure. So I, uh, I meet with a, the local moms clubs in central Ohio. And, uh, and I wanted, I've wanted to write a parenting book for many years. And I surveyed a large group of parents from this, this parents club, I should say a parents club, because dads are members as well. <laughs> but uh, I so I surveyed them. And I said, if you read a parenting book, uh, and you could only pick one off the shelf, what, what, what would be what would it be about? And unanimously, I mean unanimously, everyone said big feelings, whether it was their own or their children's or both. Uh, but how do I deal with my own frustrations, my hairpin triggers, my anxiety, my anger? Uh, and then how do I help my child through those really tough moments? And when we have tough moments, is it possible to turn them into learning opportunities? And, and how can I do that? And so that's what I completely focused the book on. And, um, and it is written by age and stage, uh, because children 
change and their emotions change at yeah. each age and stage. Uh, and so often, interestingly, our big feelings and our big p parenting challenges come about because of de developmental milestones. Because children are learning and they have to fail and make mistakes and test boundaries in order to pass through those milestones. And so um, particularly for their social and emotional development and learning, uh, those, those are the triggers for us. Uh, and so why not become more intentional about how we are reacting in those heated moments to respond to our kids with emotional intelligence and to direct them in ways that will cultivate social and emotional skills. Wonderful, Jennifer. I'm looking forward for this. And it's a new era of learning, isn't it? From where we've come from 20 years ago with a focus on assessments and testing. Yes. And now we see behind all of that, there's this shift. And I never imagined that we'd be so into talking about emotions and feelings, but it's all of that that controls the results. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if we can learn how to respond to our emotions intelligently in ways that do no harm to ourselves or to others, we, and we are able to teach our children the same, then we can really get to our core of what's our purpose in life? What's our purpose in the world? How can we best contribute to the world? How can we use our feelings as assets in that process? How can we respect our bodies, minds, and spirits and listen to them and pay attention to them and respond to them in intelligent ways so that we really can bring our, our best to the world? So I, I think that it is fundamental to raising children. Uh, and the wonderful thing is being a parent, our children give us daily opportunities to exercise our own social and emotional skills. Yes. So we can become more intelligent, emotionally intelligent human beings because we are parents. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate your time today. Is Thank there you. Oh, you're welcome. Is there anything that you think we might have missed? Any thoughts for parents or educators who might watch the YouTube or listen to the podcast to learn about how to support the home connection more? I would just say that uh, in my mind, there is nothing more important than understanding your child's development. And in fact, as a birthday gift, I suggest that parents each year read ahead on age eight, age nine, age 10, and how their children are developing physically, socially, emotionally, cognitively, so that they're prepared to support what's ahead in the coming year. Uh, but I think there's tremendous opportunity for growth and also intimacy in our our parent-child relationships if we take a focus on learning about our children's development and connecting with, with educators on that. So there's, there's great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much for your expertise and wisdom. Thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoying the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll stay up to date with our new episodes. While you're there, please feel free to give us a review or a five star rating as it helps others find us. For more information on our programs, books, and tools for schools and the workplace, visit us at www.achieveit360.com.